And uh, so I want to say at the beginning that this time, since each of our sessions are divided into two parts, I will use this time the second part for a question and answer because I haven't given you a chan chance to ask me uh, questions yet. And so uh, I'm going to go over with you Madalasa's lullaby, the, uh, the, the, what she sang to her fourth son. Uh, but first I want to address something that I'm afraid I got us into. <laughs> and I'll uh, try to address it very briefly. <clears throat> and that is uh, the question that was asked to Swami Sarva Priyananda about Vijnana. So uh, uh, the danger in mentioning something so subtle uh, very briefly is that it uh, naturally leads to misunderstandings, which wasn't my purpose. But let me just say, and I'm not, I'm not pretending to think exactly the same as Swami Sarva Priyananda, uh, but I'm not far away either. Uh, Holy Mother herself, when asked why she was so willful with Sri Ramakrishna sometimes, she said, can any two people ever agree on everything? And so if that's true of Holy Mother, it's true of everyone. Uh, I've heard many very learned Swamis speak on Vijnana, the state of Vijnana. Some who say, well, it's nothing but uh, a Shankara Advaita. It's just the same thing. Uh, the problem with that is it goes directly against what Sri Ramakrishna himself said. And that's okay, but at least we have to know that uh, it is going against what he said. There are others who say that, well, uh, his Vijnana is Vishishtadvaita, uh, but that I don't see how that could be because uh, Sri Ramakrishna's uh, Vijnana is that there is only one reality. Uh, there are no two. And uh, there's in uh, his Vijnana, there is no matter, world, and jivas. Uh, there's just Brahman. And some have said it's Shakta Advaita or the, the, the Tantric Advaita, and there are many other opinions too. Uh, my con firm conviction is, uh, and I, I'm sure of this, that it will be something debated for centuries into the future. And so I'm not going to try to put a rest to that debate now. But let me say, uh, this is uh, the main point and why I bring it up. I didn't mean by what I said to imply that there is a reality other than Brahman or to imply that the world is other than an, an appearance. Um, uh, the, the essence of Sri Ramakrishna's Vijnana, as I understand it from him, uh, my effort to understand his own words is that there is just Brahman, there's nothing else. And when we look at uh, his teaching of his own teacher, Totapuri, that's uh, confirmed. One of the things we see is that uh, when Totapuri and Sri Ramakrishna were sitting next to the Duni fire that uh, Totapuri would build every uh, night to sit in front of and meditate, uh, a worker came and took a charcoal, a, a lit coal from the fire to light his tobacco pipe. And Totapuri got furious with him that he was taking coal from the uh, sacred fire to light his uh, uh, pipe. And Sri Ramakrishna laughed and said, why is Brahman getting angry at Brahman? That is, you say that everything is Brahman and here you're getting angry at uh, Brahman for lighting Brahman with a piece of Brahman. And uh, so clearly to me, Sri Ramakrishna's Vijnana is based in Advaita. Let me just say, because again, I'm not going to give a lecture on Vijnana, uh, but let me say that my own conviction is, and I don't say that I'm right, <laughs> uh, because, uh, 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 but what my conviction is, is that there's certain things that can be explained logically and philosophically. There's certain things that can not. And I think this is one of them. Sri Ramakrishna himself said that his realizations had gone beyond the Vedas and the Vedanta. That bothers many people, but that's what he said. So maybe it's true, maybe it's not true, but do we have to face what he said? Uh, and he also said that he tried many times to explain to his close disciples his highest experience. And he said that whenever he did that, his mind would get so abstracted that he couldn't say anything. And he said that, I try to tell you, I try to explain it to you, but I can't. I can't. Uh, he would say the Divine Mother doesn't let me. I understand that to mean that it was not possible to explain it in words, what he had experienced. So again, for me, his Vijnana is clearly Advaita. Brahman is clearly the reality. The world is clearly appearance. Uh, but what exactly his 
uh, vijnana means in experience, that I think we find in experience. But what it means to me in uh, words that I can understand is, uh, as, is that there is not Brahman and Maya, there's only Brahman. Even when we see the world, we see it as Brahman whether one sees it as the dance of uh, Mother Kali or Mother Durga or the, the play of Prakriti or whatever. Uh, but uh, he would say always that uh, he saw it as nothing but Brahman, even when he saw the forms of the world. One could say, well, that again sounds like Shankara's Advaita, where there's just appearance and there's reality. I don't think that that covers the whole ground. And that's my opinion. But I wanted to say this so that you're not left with the idea uh, that uh, I believe that there is, that somehow Sri Ramakrishna's vijnana means uh, that the world is real. No, I don't, I, I don't accept that. I'm uh, with uh, Swami Sarvapriyananda 100% on, on that, and that the world is appearance. But I think that what his vijnana means uh, exactly can only be understood in experience. It's the resolution of a contradiction, which is a logical contradiction, which he found uh, resolved in the highest experience. And how that is done, let's get there and see. <laughs> so now on to uh, Madalasa's lullaby. So I told you in the la my last session about uh, the story. <clears throat> and so as I told you, Madalasa uh, would sing her lullaby to her uh, children and one by one they attained to illumination and they renounced the world, uh, saw it as illusion and uh, attained to unity with Brahman and lived in the state of uh, Paramahamsas or Avadhutas, um, uh, except for the fourth son. And as I said in the story, she named that son Alarka, which means mad dog, an extremely insulting name uh, in uh, India. It is in some other countries too, in the Muslim countries and Hindu countries, a mad dog would be about the most insulting name you could give to someone. So uh, uh, when she would, uh, when people would call her son Alarka, even as a baby, the baby would start crying. And so there's a refrain, which is not actually in the Markandeya Purana. It's a, a refrain uh, that came uh, into the tradition uh, as, a part of an ex, uh, ex, uh, explanatory uh, text for the uh, for the story in the Markandeya Purana, but it happens to be the verse which is most famous uh, associated with uh, Madalasa, and actually what it does is it tells what Madalasa sang to her sons, all four of them, and that is. Shuddho si buddho si niranjano si samsara maya parivarjito si samsara swapnam jajamo hanidram madala sola pamuva chaputram. Shuddho si, you are the pure one. Buddho si, you are illumined. Niranjano si, you are the stainless one. Samsara maya parivarjito si. You are completely free from the maya of this world. That is, you're untouched by the maya of this world. Samsara swapnam tyaja. Give up this uh, dream of the world, this dream of samsara, which is mohanidram, which comes from the sleep of ignorance. This is a profound idea uh, here. All of this is profound, of course, but here there's a philosophical profundity, aside from an experiential profundity. And that is uh, samsara swapnam, that this uh, universe is just a dream. When we are asleep, say we have a recurring dream, which many people have, a recurring nightmare, say, to make it uh, 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 more applicable. We have a recurring nightmare. Uh, and we wake up in a cold sweat uh, from fear of what's happening in the nightmare. And then the next night, the same thing happens. And maybe a few nights later, the same thing. And from time to time, it happens. It disturbs our sleep. We wake up terrified and it's very disturbing. Uh, and somebody tells us when you're sleeping, if you can realize that you're dreaming, then uh, the nightmare will disappear. 
that actually happens many, many, many years ago, I, probably before I joined the order as a teenager. Uh, but if not, it was soon after. Uh, I had a recurring uh, nightmare for a while. And this, that happened. Not that somebody told me to do that, but it just happened. One night, suddenly the nightmare, and I don't even remember the nightmare now, but the nightmare was uh, happening again. I was asleep, dreaming, taking the dream world to be real. And suddenly I realized, but I'm dreaming. Whatever it was that's chasing me, it can't get me. It's just a dream monster, whatever it was. It's just a dream. It can't touch me. I continued seeing the dream, but now I knew that it was a dream and that uh, there was nothing within the dream that could touch me. Uh, and that freed me from the nightmare. That idea that uh, uh, it wasn't a case where I woke up in a cold sweat. No, in the dream, I realized this is just a dream. This that is scaring me so much, it's nothing but a dream. That's what Vedanta tells us. And that's why what Swami Sarvapriyananda said in the last session is so important in answer to the question about Maya. Uh, why is the unreality of the world so important? That's, that's why. If we take things here serious, uh, to be real in themselves, then we find ourselves to be tied in, boxed in, tied down, locked down, chained. If we realize it's just a dream, I may still see it, but I can begin to see it as just a dream. Yes, it's appearing to my senses and all of that, but now I know that I am the light of consciousness and everything that I see is just an object, something dancing within the senses, just something happening within the mind and senses, but that's not me. This is just a dream. So again, that's a profound idea. And uh, she says, uh, uh, samsara swapnam tyaja, renounce this dream of uh, samsara of the world, which is mohanidram, which exists within the sleep of delusion. Again, there's a profound philosophical idea here, experiential, explained philosophically. And that is the idea of two levels of uh, ignorance that we suffer from. There is uh, the Avarna Shakti and the Vikshepa Shakti of Maya. Uh, scary sounding words, but all Sanskrit words sound scary until you, <laughs> until you learn them. And so Avarna Shakti means the veiling power of Maya. If you see the famous example of a rope in a, or a rope in a snake, a snake in a rope, and actually that does happen. I, I myself have seen uh, a rope and a snake. There was actually a snake there and I took it for a, a rope. <laughs> so the, that happens too. But uh, the traditional, traditional example is you take a rope for a snake, you mistake it for a snake. How is it possible, you're seeing the rope, how is it possible to mistake it for a snake? That's only possible if you're not correctly seeing the rope to begin with. If light is bright, your eyes are clear, your eyes are focused, and you look at it, you're going to see it's a rope. You're not going to see it's a snake. To mistake it, correct knowledge first has to be covered. And so Mohanidram in this verse, uh, the delusion, the sleep of delusion is the Avarna Shakti, the covering uh, 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 of Maya, which keeps us from, from seeing Brahman as it is, the Atman as it is. Again, as Swami Sarvapriyananda so beautifully explained, not as an object, but through identification, through identity. Uh, so uh, first there has to be the sleep of ignorance, which doesn't allow me to see the reality. Once I don't see the rope correctly, but I see something, then the mind is free to project a snake onto it. And so that is the vikshepa shakti, the uh, projecting power of maya, the protect, projecting power of ignorance. So there's first the veiling power without which we don't forget the reality. And then we project other things onto it. That's why this world is seen to be in Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, seen to be a dream. We project this onto the reality. We are projecting all of this. It is a dream whether you take it as an individual dream or whether you take it as the dream of the cosmic mind that we are participating in, it doesn't matter. Two different uh, viewpoints, much are argued over, uh, but it doesn't matter. Either way, it's seen as a dream. And so that she's telling her son that you are the reality, you are pure, you are stainless. 
we grow up thinking that I'm weak, I'm helpless, uh, I uh, am uh, uh, um, uh, 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 full of bad tendencies and so many things. But here, this mother, because she's illumined, she is speaking to the reality within the child, and the child responds. Uh, the child grows up uh, in illumination because it's been taught to the truth. Now, this is an extraordinary mother. You know, we can't expect that of uh, even ordinary spiritually inclined mothers. But a mother like Madalasa, she was able to speak to the reality in the child as if we were so fortunate to have a fully illumined guru, the guru would speak to the reality with, uh, within us. And every guru uh, to, uh, worth uh, their uh, salt, so to say, uh, does do that. And uh, depending on the power of the guru, uh, it has more or less uh, immediate effect. Of course, even with Sri Ramakrishna, he didn't, couldn't give illumination to everyone. It was uh, those who were ready for illumination that he could give it to. Uh, so I'm not saying that if we find the right guru, then all of our problems are over. No. We still, we still have to deal with us. Uh, but uh, that is what Madalasa was doing, was speaking to the reality in the child and, uh, and waking it up. We can see in our own lives in a very small degree, a tiny degree, dependent on our limited capacity at this point in time, uh, that if to the extent that, when, that we are conscious and we're trying to deal with the reality of other people, say, even in the, the uh, line at a cashier in a store, to the extent that we can try to see the reality within the other person, that changes the reaction of the other person towards us. It's a mysterious thing that if we try to do that, not in a sentimental way, not in a showy or uh, outwardly uh, uh, showy way, just a sincere, simple uh, effort to try to see the person as divine, to see them as pure consciousness, to see them as uh, the self uh, reflect, reflected in front of me, we find that their behavior changes. Swami Ashokananda said that at one point in uh, his youth, he would often uh, uh, be in, the, he would have the care of a baby. Uh, not full care, but maybe it was a relative, uh, the baby of a relative or something in the house. And uh, so he knew the story of Queen Madalasa. So he would tell the child or to repeat this hymn to the child, Shuddhosi Buddhosi Niranjanosi, uh, over and over again. And he said sometime later, uh, uh, he came across the child again after it was still a child, but uh, 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 a little older after they'd been separated for some time. He saw the child and uh, uh, said to it, Shuddhosi Buddhosi Niranjanosi. And the child looked at him with large eyes of recognition. And then he knew that the child had heard when the child was uh, so young, it didn't even have any words and hardly babbled yet when he used to sing this to the child. But when he said it now to the child, the child recognized uh, what he was saying. Um, so you may say that doesn't mean much, but I think it does. <laughs> um, in fact, it's interesting that uh, Hollywood once in a while picks up Vedantic stories. Walt Disney used to do that. He told in, I think it was in Bambi, the story of the uh, sheep lion that Swamiji tells, a famous Vedantic story <coughs> about the lion that was brought up by sheep and uh, led to believe it was a sheep until another lion came and saw it living among sheep and then showed it its reflection. Uh, Walt Disney put that in, I think it was in Bambi. And then in the Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, he put the Dashamas Tomasi, thou art the tenth, the eight, uh, the seven dwarves across the river. And when they got to the other side, they counted to make sure that they were all there. And each one counted only six when actually there were seven, but they were counting themselves. So that also is a famous Vedantic story that we see everything, we pay attention to everything, but we forget the main reality, which is ourself. And so all of that's to say that sometimes Hollywood picks up Vedantic stories, how God knows, but uh, there's an interesting, um, uh, it only happened in uh, one point in a uh, 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 drama on uh, a, a dramatic series where a uh, woman who had taken care of a young child or a baby, she used to tell it, you are strong, you are wonderful, uh, you, uh, you are courageous. 
uh, there were three or four words like that that she would use and she would say them over and over again to the child. And then later in this drama, uh, she said that when the child uh, grew up and she said those words to the child, the child recognized them. And uh, it had made a deep impression on the child and it had guide, become a guide to the child's life, even though she told it to the baby. So how Hollywood got that story, the story of Madalasa or whether they just came up with it themselves, I don't know. But the fact that Madalasa uh, taught this to her child uh, was what gave the children the state of illumination. So it goes on. Oh, I've got to remember the time before I forget. 22.05, okay. I don't have a lot of time before question and answers. So the second verse says, Shuddho sire dinama kritam hitat kalpana yadhunaiva panchatmakam dehamidam natesti naivasya tvam rodishikasya hetu. You are pure, oh child, dear child. You have no name. Because remember, the child would start crying. Alarka would start crying when people would call it mad dog. You have no name, which is but a product of the imagination. Your name is just a product of the imagination. How attached we are to our names. If uh, uh, um, my name is... Uh, uh, let me think of a, a difficult uh, uh, name like uh, Lars. It's not it's a very simple name, uh, but it's not common in uh, English speaking countries, like Scandinavia. If my name is Lars and someone calls me Lar uh, from America because they're not familiar with the name Lars and they forget that it has an S, then I go and correct them. It's Lars, Lars with an S, Lars. <laughs> <laughs> that happens so much. I've had it happen to me so many times because I travel in so many countries and meet people with so many ethnic names uh, that it's extremely difficult to remember uh, uh, many of the names if I have no familiarity with the linguistic back or cultural background. Uh, but we're so attached to the name. So here she's telling it that this name that you're crying over is just a product of the imagination. This body to which the name is given is made of the five elements. It doesn't belong to you, nor do you belong to it. Why then do you cry? Why do you, why do you cry, oh my child? It's just, these are just, these are things that don't pertain to you at all. <laughs> of course, one could ask if one wanted to be a little cynical, why did she have to name, if she hadn't named the child Mad Dog, she wouldn't have to sing a lullaby to it to calm it down, but then we wouldn't have a story. So um, the third verse, the, uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. The first verse that I gave you, that's not, as I said, as I said earlier, that's not part of the uh, Madalasa lullaby. That's told about the lullaby. So the verse I just gave is the first verse. You are pure, dear child. You have no name, which is but a product of the imagination. This body to which the name is given, made of the five elements, doesn't belong to you nor you to it. Why then do you cry, my child? And then the second verse. Navai bhavandro diti vishwa janma shabdo yamaya dhyama isha sunum ki vikalpa yama vidhivste gunascha bhauta sakalendri eshu This uh, says it has a, a beautiful uh, a meaning to it that the Lord, the source of the universe, Vishwa Janma, the Lord, the source of the universe doesn't cry. Here, O Prince, this word is only attributed to you. These gunas and elements are being imagined by the gunas and elements themselves and exist only in the senses, not in you. This sounds pretty heavy for a little baby, <laughs> but actually there's a profound psychology to it. When we come into this world, we don't yet identify with the body. We don't yet understand the body. Uh, we can't yet distinguish between the body and the environment. We just see a mass of sensations. We don't even know exactly what our mother is, what our father is. Uh, we gradually begin to make sense out of forms. We gradually begin to discover our body, that which we feel when we touch it. And so the baby puts its hands in its mouth it puts everything it can reach in its mouth. It puts its foot in its mouth. 
uh, is learning the extent of its body and it's taught to identify with the body. That is you. I'm over here, my child, and you are there in the body. And so at that point, when the mind of an infant is like a sponge, soaking up impressions, soaking up uh, uh, experience, the mother is telling it, none of this belongs to you, my child. You are pure, you are illumined. Uh, these things only appear like a dream to you. Uh, so then it uh, continues. Bhutani bhutai paridurbalani vridhim samayanti yate hapumsa anambupanadi bhireva tasmat na tasty vridhir na cha tasty hanihi. Through food, water, and drink, which are made of the five elements, a man's weakened elements are strengthened. That is, through food, we are uh, strengthened and we grow. But you have neither increase nor loss, which pertain to the elements alone. And then uh, uh, I, there's not time to go, if I'm going to leave time for question and answers, there's not time to go over each verse in detail. Each one is profound and each one could be the subject of a talk. But uh, there are a couple of ideas uh, that I want to come to that are more important. So I'll go through to these two ideas reading each verse, but then focusing on these two ideas and then ask for questions. Verse four says, Tom kan chuke shir yamane nijosmin tasmin dehe murhatama prajetaha shubha shubhai karma bhir deha metat mridadi bhi kan chukaste pinadhal. This jacket of the body gets worn out with time. Remember what both the Gita said and Swami Sarvapiyananda said, that the body has been compared to clothing, which we uh, change from time to time as we take rebirth. This jacket of the body gets worn out with time. Don't confuse yourself with it. This that you are learning about as a baby, this the body that you are finding out about, don't confuse yourself with it. It's just like a jacket. Uh, it's soiled by the dirt of good and bad actions, but it has nothing to do with you. The strange thing about our identification with the body is, why do I identify with this and not with the laptop, not with the uh, wall, not, I can see all of this, I can see the body, why do I identify with this? It's because of the sense of touch, because the nerve endings have gone to the extent of the skin and I identify with the tactile nerve endings. Why should I do that? Just because I feel this and I don't feel it when somebody touches the table, why should I think this is me and that's not me? I see both. This whole world comes in the, the, the experience of my five senses, but I identify with that where my tactile sense is. Uh, and so I think I end here and everything else starts there. But no, that's, uh, that's uh, ignorance. And so she says that this jacket which you wear of the, uh, the jacket of the body, it's just that, it's just a jacket, which gets soiled with good and bad karma, but it has nothing to do with you. So then she says, Tate tikin chit, tanaye tikin chit, ambe tikin chit, daite tikin chit, mame tikin chin, namame tikin chit, tuam bhuta sangham bahumana yetha. Some call you father or son. Some may call you mother or wife. Some may say you are mine or you are not mine. Don't identify with this collection of elements which they address so. And then it says, Sukhani dukho bhashavamaya bhogan Sukhaya jana tibi mudha chetaha Tanyeva dukkani punasukani janati vidwanda vibhuta chetaha. The deluded think that enjoyments are the source of happiness as they remove misery. The wise whose minds are free of delusion indeed know that what is the source of happiness now becomes itself a source of misery. That's a great uh, truth which has been repeated many times by many philosophers, including in the West. And then the last verse is uh, what I wanted to come to. 
ಯಾನಂ ಕ್ಷಿತೌ ತತ್ರ ಗತಶ್ಚ ದೇಹೋ ದೇಹೇ ಪಿಚಾನ್ಯ ಪುರುಷೋ ನಿವಿಷ್ಠ ಮಮತ್ವ ಬುದ್ಧಿರ್ನ ಯಥಾತ್ಮ್ಯ ತಸ್ಮಿನ್ ದೇಹೇತಿ ಮಾತ್ರ As when a carriage moves upon the earth, the traveler travels within it. So in the body itself, there is the self, which is separate, as if seated inside and seeming to go wherever the body goes. As there is no sense of identity of the passenger with the carriage, so do, enter, do not enter into the least delusion, O child, that you are the body. This is a profound idea also. All of the ideas here are profound, but this is one I wanted to uh, 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 especially emphasize. We identify with the body and the body moves in relationship to other objects. And I think, oh, I'm going here, I'm going there. Now I'm sitting down, now I'm standing up. It's the same in a movie theater. We're sitting in a seat watching uh, the screen And if the camera is in a car in a high-speed chase, we feel like we are moving. We're swerving from side to side. We actually feel uh, that, that, uh, that uh, there's momentum pushing us side to side physically, even though we're sitting in the chair untouched by the action. The camera is in, uh, uh, inside of a roller coaster, and the roller coaster goes up and down and uh, makes a loop and so forth. And we feel like we're going up and we're going down. We're not. But we've identified with, this, with the movie. And so we feel that we are moving. The same thing is happening here. If we begin to think, I am consciousness, I am the self. Swami Sarvapriyananda mentioned the all important idea of shifting our sense of identity. That is the most basic Advaitic practice. The most essential practice that we can do in the path of knowledge is to shift our sense of identity. Of course, that happens in bhakti also by thinking of oneself as a child of God uh, or a lover of God, whatever. But in the path of knowledge, that is uh, central, the shift of the sense of identity. To the extent that I begin to think that I am the light of awareness itself, I go nowhere. This body appears within me. This world appears within me. And when I say I'm walking from here to there, this body is moving in relationship to other things, but I go nowhere. I'm like the light of the camera, which illumines the steady screen. Uh, uh, so I'm the light which illumines everything, but I go nowhere. I neither rise nor set. I never turn on nor turn off. I'm always there. Scenes disappear. The waking state disappears. The dream state comes. But I'm still the light illumining, the steady light illumining the dream state. That disappears and uh, there's deep sleep. the awareness of nothing, not the no awareness, the awareness of no thing. Uh, I'm there illumining that, the absence of everything. Uh, I'm not unconscious. I'm there illumining the absence of uh, mental activity. But I'm there as the light illumining the absence of mental activity. That actually happened to me as a kid once. Uh, when I was 12 years old playing football, I went out for a pass and I was tackled as I caught it. Uh, and we were just playing back, back lot foot, uh, football and a uh, American football in an empty lot uh, without any equipment or protective helmets or anything. And so when I was knocked down onto the hard ground, it knocked me out just for two or three seconds. That was all. But I still remember the experience when I was knocked out. And when I came to, I thought to myself, so that's what being unconscious means. I was conscious that there was nothing. I was conscious that it was just blackness. There was nothing there, no thinking. I wasn't there, nobody was there. It was just conscious that, uh, conscious that I, uh, consciousness of nothing. Uh, and so yes, even there, the light of the self is illuminating that. We don't remember it usually because the mind takes the experience of nothing as nothing. It's not nothing, it's the experience of nothing. The illumination of nothing, of no thinking, no perception. So when, because I identify with the body, I think that I'm moving with the body. If I could see that I'm the light of awareness in which all perception takes place and all experience, including spiritual experience takes place, then I see that to know this body moves in relationship to other things, but I don't go anywhere. Swami Vivekananda said that all souls are at the same point, at the same place. All souls are right here. It's the mind, uh, the, the mind which spreads things out into apparent space. 
but all of us are right here. My heart is your heart. Your heart is everyone else's heart. Your heart, my heart is the heart of God, is the heart of the whole universe. The heart of the universe is right here. And when I point here, I mean your heart as well. I'm pointing at everyone's heart, which is right here. Not that, <laughs> don't misunderstand me, that everyone's heart is inside of Swami Atma Rupananda only. I know uh, I'm inside of you, you're inside of me. We're all in the same place, just projecting our visions of the world out uh, into time and space. And so if we can make that transition, begin to make that transition, begin. We begin to actually see the world in completely different terms. We see, as I've often said, to those of you who have uh, heard uh, many lectures of mine, hopefully not too many of you have had to suffer that, but if there's some of you who have heard many lectures of mine, you've heard me say from time to time, that it's like the Copernican uh, revolution in astronomy. Ptolemy's uh, Ptolemaic astronomy, which ruled uh, the Western world until the time of Copernicus, uh, said that the earth is the center of the universe and all the stars and planets and the sun, everything moves around the earth. That is true. That's true. The earth is the center of the universe and everything moves around the earth. If you take the earth as your viewpoint, it makes just as much sense to say the earth is the middle of the universe as to say anything else is. And so it's quite true that everything moves around the earth if you want to take the earth as your, uh, your standpoint. But what Ptolemaic astronomy meant was that the uh, circuits or the uh, movements of the planets as opposed to the stars were extremely complicated. If you think that the earth is the center of the universe, including the center of the solar system, then the movements of the planets are extremely co uh, complex to calculate. They could calculate them to an extent, but it was very, very complicated. But then Copernicus said, no, the sun is the center of the solar system and all of the planets, including the earth are moving around the sun. Suddenly the heavens made sense in a way they had never made sense before. Suddenly the calculation was simple. And so we come up with a scientific principle that simplicity is a sign of truth. Simplicity is a sign of truth. And when you begin to shift your sense of identity, to the self, to the light of awareness, which never goes anywhere, which never goes out. Suddenly you see that the whole world makes sense in a way it never did before. And then you realize this is a higher truth because it brings extreme simplicity. It makes sense, whereas before it didn't make sense, the world. Uh, and so that's a great, uh, a great truth to learn. And so that's what Madalasa was teaching here. So let me close and open up for question and answers before I take up all of the time uh, with uh, just uh, talking. To close on uh, Madala, so I may say some more words about her tomorrow. I will say some more words about her and about the Devi Sukta in relationship to the Holy Mother, Sarada Devi. But let me say that I wanted to take uh, these three texts from women Advaitins uh, because uh, you get a perspective that you don't usually get. Yes, the self is beyond gender. And Madalasa had realized the same Brahman uh, that Shankaracharya realized, that Sri Ramakrishna realized, that Swami Vivekananda realized, and that we think good Jesus realized. Uh, but as far as expression goes for human society, for our uh, purposes, the expression is different. Here you get the beautiful story of a mother who is singing a lullaby to her child and bringing her child up to be a knower of Brahman. Uh, they, the whole, the whole uh, psychological and emotional ambience around the teaching is quite distinct, not different, not opposing, not contradictory in any way whatsoever, but there's a different flavor to it. And that is uh, the value of these, the Devi Sukta, uh, Madalasa's instruction and Holy Mother's Advaita. Uh, the Madalasa's expression is quite different from the Devi Suktam. As I said, Devi Suktam, she gives both a heroic, uh, dynamic view of Chit Shakti, the, the power of consciousness. <coughs> She's obviously identified with Brahman, the one reality, which is not, it's beyond any idea of dynamism. But she's speaking to the world, which is perceived from the standpoint of a knower of Brahman. 
and she speaks as Swami Vivekananda similarly spoke uh, and as Sri Krishna spoke from the standpoint of uh, the, uh, the source or, or the reality in the midst of this uh, great dynamism. Here, Madalasa is speaking to a baby and giving it the highest truth. You are Brahman. This world is a dream. Uh, wake up from the dream. And her children did wake up. But again, there's great value to seeing the, the different expressions of, uh, uh, of uh, Advaita. Advaita means non-dualism. And there can't be many non-dualisms. It's not that there are all kinds of non-dualisms. There are different philosophies that try to explain it in different ways. But in reality, there can't be many non-dualisms. But when you come to expression here in this world where everything is diverse, everything is different, not one thing is like another thing. Here there are infinite expressions of that Advaitic truth uh, within this world of samsara. And so that is part of what I wanted to show. So now I'll be quiet. And let me ask if there are any questions. Swami, <clears throat> what do you mean by heart? Do you refer to consciousness by heart? Uh, do I refer? To, I'm sorry. I'm just looking at uh, what time I have to stop. I have, so I'm not, dist not distracted, but I wanted to be sure not to go over. By heart, uh, that's a, a very good question. Uh, and uh, uh, the... Heart refers generally as far as a place in the body to the lower center of the chest, not the physical blood pumping organ, but the lower center of the chest. The problem with that is that when one goes beyond body consciousness, then, uh, that, uh, then you, realize, you realize the heart, but then there's no location within the body. And so it's from Vedic times, Upanishadic times especially, uh, and all over the world, the heart was considered, not again, the blood pumping organ, but the lower center of the chest was considered in reference to the body, a place where the highest center of consciousness was most uh, easily uh, discovered and expressed. Uh, and so the, when I say the heart, that's what I mean, but it should not be understood as a bodily part, nor should it be understood to be limited by the body. The body actually is inside of the heart. The universe is inside of the heart. But when we are conscious of the body and we are seeking in relationship to the body, the highest uh, uh, locus of uh, pure consciousness, the easiest place to find it has been found to be in the heart. Some find it here and that's fine. Some find it here, that's fine. Uh, some find it out there, uh, which is okay. But the usual place is here. You find that in Christianity, in uh, Sufi uh, Islam, in Buddhism, in uh, the, uh, the uh, Om Mani Padme Hum, the famous Tibetan mantra. Uh, that's speaking about the heart, the, uh, uh, the, the lotus of the heart. That's why we meditate in the heart. So uh, in the Chandogya Upanishad, it says that by closing out all, closing all of the senses, closing out the world, uh, one withdraws into the heart. And after closing out the world, forgetting the world completely and withdrawing into the heart, there one discovers the whole universe. Strange. A paradox. You close out the world, you go into the heart, and there you find that that is where the world existed all of the time. So that's what I mean. <laughs> Any other question? Coming up here. Swami, can we transpose the statement of knowledge into the devotional path? For example, teach me that the loving of which I come to love all. Teach me the loving through which I come to love all? To which I co uh, come to love all, of which I come to love all. That kind uh, yes. of devotion. Yes, if I understand the question correctly. Uh, there is not a contradiction between the path of devotion and the path of knowledge. Uh, one can follow both together, and how one combines them will depend on one's temperament, whether one is more of more devotional, including jnana in the path of devotion, or more in the path of knowledge and including devotion in that. There's an infinite spectrum of ways to combine the two. The two are not contradictory. They are, they can be 
uh, seen as two different paths and they are integral. You can follow this or you can follow that or you can follow that or that or that or that. So um, uh, there are different ways of combining them. But one thing to understand is uh, that in Vedanta, when we think, and again, if we take Advaita Vedanta as our background philosophy, which most people in the Ramakrishna movement do, whether they are devil, uh, do, uh, followers of bhakti or jnana or karma or whatever, if we do, if we take Advaita as our background philosophy, but I want to follow devotion as my uh, path. Uh, one thing that we should remember that in, in Vedanta, Swami Vivekananda emphasized over and over again, never think that God is someone separate and outside of me. I may find it easier to think of God as an object, as the divine object, the ideal to which I pray and which I seek and which I love. But even then, don't think that God is actually out there and separate from me, because that is the source of ignorance and the source of fear. Uh, and so always remember that either God is the whole and I'm the part, God is the ocean and I'm the wave on the ocean, and the wave depends on the ocean. As the famous song says, uh, the wave belongs to the ocean, the ocean does not belong to the wave. Uh, 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 or however, to always remember that in Advaita Vedanta, even in Vishishta Advaita Vedanta, but especially in Advaita Vedanta, that we are never separate from God. The one we pray to is our own higher self. I may experience myself as an individual, but I pray to the Holy Mother, I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, I pray to Swami Vivekananda, Jesus, whomever. I pray to them as my ideal, my highest ideal. And my ideal is really, even when we don't know it, is my picture of my highest ideal. That is me as the highest ideal. Sri Ramakrishna is that which I aspire to. Holy Mother is that which I aspire to. Jesus, Vivekananda, whomever. Uh, and so one can, uh, one can have an Advaitic understanding and yet seek uh, the beloved. The puja that we do is based on non-dualism. We identify ourselves uh, uh, in the puja through meditation and mantra and visualization with uh, Brahman. And then we see the Ishta taking form out of the light within our own hearts. And then we take that and put it on the altar and worship. And so, yes, love, love is what? What is love? Love that we seek, what is love? Love sought after love, love that we seek after is the yearning for union. Love found is unity. Love for someone, for a human being, for a dog, for a ferret, <laughs> for whatever. Uh, love uh, seeks to be one with its object of love. And uh, so love is the greatest unifying force. Love is the greatest purifying force. If we fall in love with another human being, all we want to do is to think about them. All we want to do is to be with them. We want to see them. We want to speak to them. Uh, 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 and as, uh, if we are in love with another person, then the mind becomes focused. Everything that we see, everything that we hear, it reminds us of the person that we love. And so that is the same with God. The only thing is that in human love, no matter how wonderful it is, it never is perfect. There are always disappointments. There are always frictions. There's always some human selfishness that comes in. God is the object of ideal love. There, there are no disappointments. There, there are no limitations. There, there's no ending. God isn't going to die on us and leave us. <laughs> uh, nor God isn't going to run away for another, uh, for another person. Uh, in God, there's no disappointment. And so there we can learn to let our love flow to God. Uh, and in flowing to God, it brings us to God. Now think, if you love God deeply, if you love God with your whole heart and you're rushing towards God out of love. Now, most of us have a little bit of devotion, so this is an imaginary exercise, yes. But imagine that we had developed the love of a, of a saint for, uh, for God, a Saint Teresa of Avila or Saint Francis of Assisi. And we're rushing towards God in our prayer and our meditation. Are we going to come to a point where 
we see uh, the ocean of love, which is God, the ocean of beauty, the ocean of bliss, the ocean of perfection in front of us, God is in front of us. And we say, okay, I'm going to stop right here. I don't want to come any closer. No, we're going to plunge in like the moth diving into the flame of a candle and extinguishing itself out of love for the flame. I'm not speaking scientifically, I'm speaking metaphorically. That is a, a famous metaphor, the love of the moth for the flame, where it extinguishes it's, uh, itself in the flame. But extinguishing ourselves in the love of God is eternal life. As St. Paul says in the Christian Bible, as uh, Hindu saints have said, as Sufi saints have said. So let me end because now my time is up. Uh, by just uh, paraphrasing, and I wish I could quote because the uh, original is so much more beautiful, paraphrasing one of the many extraordinary po uh, poems of Rumi, the great Persian uh, Sufi poet. He says, what have I ever lost by dying? I was a mineral, I died and I became a plant. I was a plant, I died and I became an animal. I was an animal, I died and I became man. I was a man. I died and I became God. What have I ever lost by dying? The drop falls into the ocean, afraid of losing its dropness. But when it falls into the ocean, it becomes the ocean. What have I ever lost by dying? <laughs>